In the times of the prophets, uh, God used uh, many very interesting and I, I dare say odd examples and analogies to communicate with us, his people, and, and to teach us some lessons. Um, now we use one of those to introduce the topic today. Um, and I, I spoke on, uh, on this subject down in Portland. Um, it wasn't a, a farewell sermon to that extent, uh, but it was a sermon that I wanted to give them to encourage them to, to stay on their path, the path that they're on, and took an opportunity to poke some fun at, at a couple of uh, longtime friends. Uh, many of you know Fred Reeves, and uh, some of you may know Ken Lauchs as well. I, um, I decided not to poke fun at anybody here yet. I don't know you well enough to, to make this come across in the right fashion, but I had them stand up. I asked Mr. Reeves and Mr. Lauchs to stand up at the beginning of the sermon, and I, I asked both of them a question. I said, are you wearing underwear? And I got some laughs, and they were uncomfortable. And uh, I hadn't talked to them beforehand, so it was a, it was a surprise. And uh, they both said yes, and I said I hoped that they would say yes. Uh, I, I said, Are, I assume they're clean and they're your Sabbath best, and they both shook their head. Did not give uh, Mr. Lauchs a chance to respond to me because I knew he would formulate some kind of smart aleck response. And so I cut him off and made him sit down. <laughs> he complained to me about that later, but, um, but it was smart of me to do that. I asked, him also, I asked them both also, would you be willing to, to swap underwear? And of course, no is the answer to that. And of course, no, that would be the answer to any of us if we were asked that question. Uh, I didn't, don't want to take credit for that intro. A friend of mine had that intro to this subject. I kind of swiped it from him because I thought it was apropos for the weekend down there. Yeah, I'm hoping that no one here would be happy to trade underwear as well. I know that's uncomfortable, but it's your underwear. It's kind of personal, isn't it? Something very personal. Turn to Jeremiah 13, if you would. Some of you may know where I'm going. You may be thinking that this is a strange way to begin a message on the Sabbath. I would agree with you, it is a very strange way but we are going somewhere. Jeremiah 13, verse 1, out of the King James Version, says, Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and get thee a linen girdle, and put it upon your loins, and put it not in water. So God tells Jeremiah, Don't wash it, don't clean it, just put it on. Now what's a girdle? Well, the Hebrew word is azor, if you go to Brown, Driver, and Briggs and uh, Hebrew definitions, it says a waist cloth, the innermost piece of clothing and, and or a waistband. So there's differing opinions. When you look into the commentaries, there's differing opinions on exactly what this piece of clothing was. Uh, some say it was a belt, a sash tied around uh, the waist to hold up the loins. Some say a loin cloth. In any case, the Lord says to Jeremiah to get a new pair of linen underwear or a new waist cloth to hold up his loins. Don't wash them, just put them on. In verse 2, so I got a girdle according to the word of the Lord, and I put it on my loins. And the word of the Lord came unto me a second time, saying, Take the girdle that thou hast got, which is upon thy loins, and arise, go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole in a rock. Now imagine God saying this to you, brethren. I want you to get a new pair of underwear, and I want you to put them on. Don't wash them. I want you to put them on, and I want you to wear them. And I want you to wear them for a while. Some of the commentaries say it could have been a long time. It could have been as long as a year, or maybe more. And then God again says, you know those underwear I told you to get a while ago that you've been wearing? And I want you to go down to the river, take them off, and I want you to bury them under a rock. Pretty strange. Pretty strange. By this time, Jeremiah might have been smelling quite 
Stinky. Verse 5. So I went and I hid it by the Euphrates, as the Lord commanded me. And it came to pass, after many days, that the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take the girdle from thence, which I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates, and I dug, and I took the girdle from the place where I had hid it. And behold, the girdle was marred. It was profitable for nothing. Now, if it wasn't already unwearable when Jeremiah put it in there, it certainly was destroyed, decayed by now, unwearable, unusable. Verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, After this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people which refuse to hear my words which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. Now listen to verse 11. For as the girdle cleaves to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the house of Judah, says the Lord that they might be unto me for a people, and for a name, and for a praise, and for a glory, but they would not hear. In this account, God has described the relationship he desires to have with Israel, Judah, as close and as personal and as private as a pair of underwear. That's pretty private. That is pretty close. This section of Jeremiah, God addresses the prideful nature that had caused the relationship between he and Judah and Israel to be soiled, to be dirtied. People of God had allowed this precious, close, personal and private and intimate relationship with him to become unusable. Jeremiah 13.10 says, profitable for nothing. In verse 11, God had intended a people he had chosen to cleave unto him as close and tight as a pair of underclothing. And yet they soiled that relationship. Now God is absolute. You know, we're talking about the all-powerful being in the universe. We're talking about a, a being that described himself as being an alpha, an omega. He invented time. He supplies the power by which all things living can exist. He spoke and things just happened. Things just appeared, were created. He created everything, both the spirit and the physical. His thoughts are so far above ours. It's just not in our realm to comprehend what is on the mind of God continually. There's no being like him. There's no being like him. This is an analogy that God chose to use when describing the relationship he desired with his people. How close, brethren, how close, how intimate, how personal is your relationship with that God being? Would you say you have a friendship with God? I mean a real friendship. Not just a passing friendship, not just one that you may call once a month, but a real, personal, close, intimate friendship. Would you say you have that? How is it even possible if you allow your mind to think about the power of God and who he is, how is it even possible to have that kind of friendship with a God being like that? And how is it possible that God and Jesus Christ want to be friends with us? Well, it's not only possible, brethren, but God has done all that he has done from creation of the 
angelic and spirit realm, creation of the universe, creation and recreation of the earth, creation of the seventh day Sabbath, the holy day plan, the whole plan that spells out what he's doing here on earth, the sacrifice of his son, the giving of the Holy Spirit, all that he's done and is still doing to this day is for one purpose, and that is to have a personal friendship with you. You know, all the work that God the Father and Jesus Christ have accomplished so far, and all the work that still lays out in front of them, and, you know, they're carefully designing, perfectly designing uh, all of this so that he can call you a friend of his. As the Lord said through Jeremiah, he wants to be as close and private and personal and intimate as the innermost piece of clothing that you wear every single day. Odd, but very endearing. This passage really begins to make some sense when you think about it in terms of your prayers to God. You know, I, I asked Mr. Reeves and Mr. Laux, would they be willing to trade underwear? And of course, they shook their heads no, and I'm glad. <laughs> but I don't think either one of these men want to share what they prayed to God about that morning before they came to church. How about you? In your prayers this morning, in your private prayers about your sins and your strugglings and your fears and your anticipations, you like to share those with people? I mean, the intimate ones, the ones that are private to you and God. Do you want to share those? The things we pray to our God about are private. I'd really be embarrassed personally if you could hear my personal prayers to God. There are times they're really private and they're really personal. I don't want anyone seeing my dirty underwear, right? How about you? You want others to hear yours? The answer would be no, of course not. This relationship that the Father has begun with each of us is personal and it's intimate. And I hope we view it that way, because God views it that way. We should have a real, working, tangible friendship with God. So if we're wondering how we can have this kind of friendship with God, or how we can improve our relationship with God, one of the ways is to examine some of the people that were friends of God in Scripture. Uh, scriptures are full of case studies, if you will, of uh, for us to examine and glean from. We'll do a little bit of that. Case study number one is Noah. You know, Noah was a man that walked with God. Um, I'll just read through some of these scriptures. You can jot them down if you like and go back later. Genesis 6, 9 says, Noah was a, a just man, a perfect, uh, per perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. So Noah was just, he was a lawful man, he, he understood and he obeyed the laws of God and also the laws of man around him. Now, no man was perfect except for Jesus Christ, but we know Noah was complete. That's what that word means, it was complete or sound in the generations of his life. He walked with God every day. He literally and figuratively walked with God. Noah had a desire uh, to walk alongside God, to mimic Him, to be like Him. And he had a personal relationship with God. To be called righteous by God and to live in the world that Noah lived in, where God made the statement there was nothing redeemable on the planet save Noah. Noah had to have a friendship with God for God to have to say that. Abraham, Isaiah 41.8 says, But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. 
This next verse is taken from uh, King Jehoshaphat's prayer while he stood in the temple court and exclaimed in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of the land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of, of Abraham, your friend, forever? Wouldn't it be something if someday some king or some someone else was praying to God and said something like this about you. Your friend forever. To be recognized that way. Wouldn't that be something? I want that to be said about me someday. Don't you? What about Moses? Exodus 33, 11 says, So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. They chatted. They had a conversation. You know, it wasn't like we do today. It wasn't Snapchat or Instagram or texting or, uh, you know, uh, some kind of face-to-face -face app. They were face-to-face, -face, in person, having a conversation as a man speaks to his friend. King David, Acts 13, 22 says, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Obviously, King David was a friend to God. He obeyed God. He was a friend to God. How about, how about Peter? You know, Andrew heard John uh, speak about Jesus, and he went and found his brother, uh, Simon, and said, we found the Messiah. You remember that occasion? We found the Messiah. And so he grabbed his brother Simon and they rushed off to see Jesus. And in John 1 42, <coughs> John 1 42, and he brought him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, You're Simon, son of Jonah. You should be called Peter, the rock. How would you like that to happen to you? Just met Christ. Just walked up, shook his hand, and introduced yourself, and Christ says, you're Peter. That's what I'm going to call you. You're the rock. i bowl you over a little bit. Peter was a rock. Remember, he was the first to walk on water to Christ for a little while. And he was the first to exclaim Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Peter was the first to defend Jesus Christ in the garden. Boy, he went right to it. Cut off that man's ear. It wasn't the proper thing to do. Peter was bold. He was a man's man. Jesus Christ chose Peter to lead the church physically after his death and resurrection to his father's throne. You know, put yourself in Peter's shoes for a moment. Imagine... Christ coming to you and saying, Peter, you know, I'm, I'm going to be gone for a while. I'm leaving now. But I have a favor to ask you, my friend. I want you to take over the physical leadership of the church. Wow. Can you imagine that conversation? What about Paul? He's one of the most important apostles. Uh, he spent three years with Christ one-on-one -on -one, and, you know, to spend three years one-on-one uh, -on -one with Christ, he had to become friends with Christ. Paul would go on to do some pretty miraculous things in his life. Um, of course, the record shows um, some of the most powerful books in the Bible uh, came from uh, Paul's writings. Um, some of the the real challenges that we face in life, uh, some of the real fighting against sin and, and the warring that goes on in our minds and our hearts, Paul puts down in words for us. Paul was a man of the people in that regard. You know, these are, these are men that are glowing examples of how to have a personal friendship with God. Noah, Abraham. Moses, David, Peter, Paul. 
you know, I ask myself, how can I have this kind of relationship that these men had with my God? I mean, these are giants. We read about these giants in history. How could I ever have this kind of relationship with God, this level of friendship? I think sometimes we can get stuck in a place where we think that these men are the only ones that could have these, this kind of close, personal relationship with God. And we can think about ourselves being not worthy. I'm not worthy. And that's a fair point. If you think that way, you're not. You're not worthy. Neither am I. But you know what? Neither were any of these men worthy of having that relationship with God. Was Abraham worthy? He was a friend of God. He was called a friend of God. Abraham, if you remember, had an extremely beautiful wife, Sarah. You remember the story? If she was so beautiful, he was stressed out all the time about how gorgeous she was everywhere they went, right? And there were two occasions, especially this one, where God had to save Abraham from his own demise because he lied to the king, right? Sarah's my sister. Okay, so it wasn't a complete lie, but it was still a lie. He practiced deception to save his own skin, and he was willing to throw his wife under the bus to do it. That was Abraham. Now, God had to step in and expose Abraham's deception to, to keep the king from, from sinning and taking her as a wife. That was Abraham, friend of God. Moses was, was worthy, though, right? I mean, Moses. Moses committed murder. He killed the man. And then he ran away. Now we can say, well, this was before Moses really committed to God and you know, that relationship hadn't started. Remember, Moses had to deal with millions of Israelites, stiff-necked Israelites, uh, year in and year out. And in Numbers 20, Moses uh, didn't follow specific instructions uh, by God to speak to the rock so that it would yield water for the people. You remember that situation where him and Aaron were standing there before the people, and it seems in anger, Moses struck the rock twice, and then he said, must we bring water for you out of this rock? You know, Moses supplies a good lesson for those of us in leadership positions. The rock was a symbol of Christ who was to provide living water to his people. Yet Moses struck it twice and then laid claim to that water that flowed from it. You know, the word of God and the spirit are given by God, and not by Moses, certainly not by any, anyone else but God. Moses, who talked face to face with God as a friend, fell prey to sin and was disciplined harshly by God. What about David? Now, David has the unenviable position in Scripture of having a lot of his sins laid bare to us to see. Um, David had a heart that God said eventually resembled his own. And that's amazing when we read through David's life and some of the things that he did. Um, you, we know many of David's faults, uh, unfortunately for David, but we know that he was up on the roof and he saw Bathsheba bathing on her housetop and he lusted for her. He followed through with that lust by having her brought into the castle. They, um, they had a relationship, they even had a, uh, she even got pregnant following that sin instead of realizing that it was sin and he would have to go before God and ask for forgiveness. How did he deal with it? Well, he sent to the front lines to, for her husband, brought Uriah back, right? Gave Uriah a chance to go sleep with his wife one night. 
But Uriah was so honorable that he denied himself that pleasure, slept on the doorstep. And he stated that the rest of his men were out fighting. How could he do that? How could he take advantage of that? Can you imagine David? He was really trying to turn that situation around, and it didn't work for him. You would think Uriah's character would have caused David to take a pause and to see his sin, but it didn't. David went even further. Gave him a letter, sent him back to uh, the battle lines, told his superiors, put him on the front lines. David killed the man to cover up his sexual sin. That was a man that eventually God said resembled his own heart. Turn to Mark 14, 29, if you would. What about Peter? Here was a man who became that rock for the New Testament church that uh, Jesus said he would be, that small rock. Uh, God used Peter in such a powerful way, providing steady leadership to God's growing church. And we break into a passage where Jesus Christ was telling his disciples how taxing the night would be on all of them before his crucifixion. All of them would be made to stumble, and uh, Scripture uh, records uh, point to Peter here in Mark 14, 29. Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Yes, I hear what you're saying, Christ, but I'm not going to stumble. Not me. I'm not going to do it. Christ said to him, sure, assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And then Peter spoke more Vietnamese. He said, If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And then they all said likewise. You know, Peter's the ringleader. Out front. The rest of them said, Yeah, I'm with him. We're not going to deny you. Now we know the rest of the account. Peter denied Christ three times. And the last time resorted to him swearing to distance himself from his master. You know, you would think that Peter, upon hearing the rooster crow once, he would have said to himself, Oh, Christ said I would do this. You would think that would have drove him to his knees. But it didn't. What Christ foretold for Peter came true. This was Peter. Peter. This was the man who Christ said was a rock. Physical rock, but a rock. And then we go on to anchor the New Testament church. Peter was not worthy. He was not worthy. Turn to Romans 7. You know, what about Paul? Romans 7 records this mental struggle that I uh, referenced earlier between our sinful, carnal desires and the Spirit of God and the struggle that Paul describes in himself is not early in his ministry here. Um, certainly, uh, Paul struggled like we did. Um, Romans 7, uh, in verse 14, we'll pick it up in verse 14. I'll read it out of the New Living Translation just to make the words a little more palatable. Verse 14, So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. You know, Paul is saying things that probably we have said to ourselves a number of times. I know what I should be doing, but I just don't do it. It just doesn't happen. Verse 16, but if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So the law identifies what we're doing as wrong, so I, I understand it. So I'm not the only one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. 
I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. If these men, brethren, were considered friends of God, how did God consider them friends in the face of these egregious sins that are displayed for us in Scripture? What is it that God is doing here? What's God trying to accomplish? You know, God's allowing time and place to happen. He's allowing character to, to be developed. God's building a family. And what's a family? Isn't a family a collection of close friends? Isn't that what family is? There are people you consider the closest of friends, people you, you work with for common goals and ideals, people who help each other, they support each other, they encourage each other, they, f they forgive one another, people you enjoy being around, people you would sacrifice for. That's family. That's friendships. You know, something all these giants of Scripture experienced in their lives was a time of separation from God. What separates us from God? Well, we know sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2 says, Behold, the, Lord, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Sin separates us from God. Israel and Judah, the people of God in Jeremiah 13, allowed sin to come between them and God. They dirtied their pants so, with so much pride that, that God just let them go into captivity. They took a friendship with God Almighty, and they just made a mess of it. You know, I, what does this situation harken back to? You know, we know the story of Lucifer. Lucifer was the most beautiful and spectacular angelic creation that God had made. Ezekiel 28 points that out, says he was the seal of perfection. God viewed him as the seal of perfection, most perfect creation, pretty high praise. Something happened. In Lucifer. His heart was lifted up because of his perfection, because of a pride that began to build in his heart. And it says that that pride turned to arrogance and he allowed a sinful desire then to take control. And he began to desire God's position over his own. He began to feel like he should have that. Pride and arrogance are markers of who Satan is. This had found its way into God's people in Jeremiah's time, and God had had enough, and he sent them into exile. Satan is the original sinner, and it's no surprise that pride and arrogance can be found all over the world. We bump up against it all day long, every day, it's something we hopefully recognize when we do <clears throat> bump up against it. But it is very identi identifiable in the world today. And like I said, you can see it, turn on the radio, the TV, bump into people at work, uh, listen to it in our politics. It's everywhere. Pride and arrogance lives very strongly today in Satan's world. But it's even affected the people of God, not just in Jeremiah, but all down through time. Pride has found its way into the people of God. And if you've been in the church for any length of time at all, you have seen pride do its work in the church. It's not pleasant. What would have caused God to forgive Israel and Judah's pride? Humility which would have led them to repentance. God would have forgiven them. Pride cannot even enter our minds, brethren. You know, God's building a family, 
And if you think about it in these terms, to be a God being with all the power and the authority to use that power, God cannot take the, the chance of having a God being who is ruled by pride and arrogance. They must be humble. They must be humble to have that kind of power. You know, God's working with each of us just as he worked with these giants that we read about. He needed to build in them a humility and instill in them a hatred for sin. To hate sin. To hate anything that's contrary, that would produce something that was contrary to God. He needed to build in them, again, humility so that they could handle what he had in store for them in the future. This is character. It doesn't happen by fiat. So one thing that God can't snap his fingers and create, he wants character. And he's willing to allow us to live this life and to go through many poor and good experiences to build the character that we need so that he can entrust us to be his child. Consider these men again. Remember Peter, after the rooster crowed, he denied Christ a third time. What did he do? He wept. Probably an understatement. He wept. Tough Peter. How do we think Peter felt at that moment? Can you put yourself in his shoes? Hard to do, because it seems extreme what Peter did. But he wept. He was repentant. He was remorseful. Paul, Romans 7, 24 says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul, a repentant before God. Verse 25 of, of Romans 7 says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You know, Paul continues in Romans 8 to help us see God is after what we, we can accomplish in our lives with the Spirit. It's no longer about the sin that soils our pants and cause us, causes us to be divided from God. It's not about the sin. It's about what the Spirit is actively doing in our lives that produces godly character, that binds us to God. You know, God's not concerned about what sin can do because he can wipe that out. He has control over that. But what he's waiting for is for us to come to him and re be repentant. He's, he can wipe all of that away. Psalm 51, if you'll turn there. You know, we recognize Psalm 51 as being Psalm of David. It's really one of the most beautiful gifts, I think, in Scripture. Um, like I said before, not many of us would like to share what our personal prayers are to God because they're deeply personal to us. But we have an opportunity to peer into David's heart in Psalm 51 and to listen to a prayer that he prays to God. It starts out in verse 1, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So this is following his sin with Bathsheba. And here is David's heart. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. 
Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever said those words? Take my sins away, God. Throw them away. Get rid of them. I don't want them. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. I have prayed this prayer before. In tears, how about you? Have you been in that spot before? I have. Skip down to verse 16. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. And in verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. You know, it's no doubt when we get to peer into the heart of David, why God considers him such a close friend. That God looks down at the heart of David and he sees the humility required to be a future son in his family. Sins, yeah, God can wipe those away. They don't bother God in that sense. He can get rid of them and he can forget them. I would like that ability. The character, the humble, the meek attitude. This is what God cherishes. This is what God can do his work in. What do we do when the inner garment that you're wearing is not as clean as you'd like it to be? You turn to Christ, your older brother, your friend, and you have a good long talk. You have a conversation. Christ was human. He knows what we're going through. Uh, he was tempted by sin just as we are, and he now sits at the right hand of God the Father, and he, he intercedes in our behalf daily. And just as he worked with the men and women in the past that we read about in Scripture, these people that he considers friends, he can do this with us. When we're in a pursuit of a relationship with God and everything else is second. We put everything else second to pursuing that relationship with God. When we humble ourselves before God and we come to God like David did here in Psalm 51. What do you think this conversation is like in heaven between Christ and God the Father? Hey, it's Rob. It's Rob again. Yeah, I know you. You're a friend of mine, of course. What can I do for you? Can you imagine that conversation? The Lord spoke to Moses, as Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. <clears throat> do you have a conversation <clears throat> with God like Moses did? <clears throat> <clears throat> David, <clears throat> David prayed many times a day, sometimes all night, we know from Scripture. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. Are you in constant contact with God? Is he your friend? Is he accompanying you along the way every day? Is there this banter, this conversation that's going back and forth every day? Jesus Christ prayed all night in the garden while his closest friends took a nap. <laughs> they were sleeping during one of the most important times in human history. And there they slept. They were still his friends though, right? Being worthy is not a prerequisite to having a close relationship with God. Recognizing that you're not worthy is a prerequisite. Our Father has really made this process as simplistic as he can. <clears throat> I know living God's way of life in a world that is bent the other direction and constantly facing satanic influence at every corner, that's not easy. And I won't cheapen that. It's difficult. But God's made the process as simplistic as he can. 
First John 1 8 and 9, and I'll just read it. First John 1 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God the Father is generous in his forgiveness. Why? Because he's our parent. <laughs> Because he's dead. It's the whole point of what's going on here. He's building a family. He loves us and he's eager to forgive us when we come to him in the right attitude. Our sins really pale in insignificance to the plan that God has in place for you. They just pale in insignificance. Revelation 7 talks about a mass of people coming out of the Great Tribulation, and their robes are white. How did their garments become white? They were washed in the blood of Christ, our elder brother. Revelation 22, <clears throat> verse 14 says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. You know, half the translations say, Blessed are those that wash their robes. What do you do when your garments are not clean? What do you do when your relationship with God isn't what you want it to be? Turn to Philippians 3, if you would. How were Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Peter, Paul considered friends of God? Simple. Simple. They repented of sin and they moved on toward righteousness as often as possible. Christ knew them. They were friends of his and he forgave them. Philippians 3, and we'll pick it up in verse 12. <clears throat> it says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Jesus Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. You know, Paul learned to leave his past behind and focus on the things of God. It was counterproductive. He knew it was counterproductive for him to look back behind him. But to always look ahead at what God had for him. That had to be incredibly difficult for Paul. We know who Paul was a persecutor of those that followed Christ. And yet Paul is schooling us here. Don't look behind. Look ahead. Repent of those things behind you and move forward. Encouraging words by Paul. 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 25 through 29, Paul says, God isn't calling the physically wise or the mighty or the noble, but the base and the foolish of the world to put to shame those that believe they are something special on their own. You know, God's doing these things for a purpose because it's his power that makes it work. And in verse 29, he says that no flesh should glory in his presence. Humility. God was present at the throne when his most perfect creation allowed pride to get in the way. Lucifer lusted for what God had. And that lust, that pride, that arrogance, that anger turned him into Satan, an adversary to God. God set his plan in motion with imperfect and flawed humans for this reason, to help us build humility, not pride, to teach us love, not arrogance or selfishness, but to learn to be a friend 
to God. Satan didn't get this. Israel and Judah at the times of old didn't get this. Frankly, many in the church of God in my lifetime haven't got this. God wants you and I to get this. Turn to John 15, if you would, we finish up. You know, how do we be a friend to God? It, it takes a broken spirit, a repentant heart, and a willingness to submit to him. John 15, these are very recognizable verses here. We read them at least once a year, if not more. John 15, and let's pick it up in verse 14. It says, You are my friends if you do the things which I command you. Well, what does he command? Well, go up to verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another, even, if I, even as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do these things which I command you. Verse 15, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father I have made known unto you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide. Should abide how long? Forever. That whatever, whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Why? Because you're my friend. And I want to give you those things. God the Father and Jesus Christ want to have a close, personal, intimate friendship with you. Personally. For eternity. Not just today, but forever. On into eternity. Brethren, as mom, my mom always used to say, make sure you pack a clean pair of underwear for the journey.